Welcome. Um, so, as uh, Zeb mentioned, we study socioeconomic disparities in my lab and how it relates to human brain development. Uh, so the human brain has been termed the most complex three pounds in the universe. And it's not hard to see why when we consider the fact that we're born with 100 billion neurons or brain cells, and every minute in the first few months of life, we develop between 250,000 and 500,000 new brain cells. But it turns out it's not just the number of cells that's so extraordinary, but really the connections between cells. These brain connections between our cells become increasingly complex in the first several years of life. So uh, here I'm showing you the brain connections or synapses at birth, at three months, and at two years. And it turns out that by age three, we have a thousand trillion connections or synapses uh, between our cells. What I think is so fascinating about this uh, phenomenon, though, is that early experience shapes this brain developmental pattern. Uh, so many of you have likely heard of the use it or lose it phenomenon, whereby connections that are used frequently are strengthened, whereas those that are not are dropped or pruned. And it turns out that the brain is most plastic or able to make new connections early in childhood. Now, of course, a child's experience is very tremendously as a function of his or her social and economic circumstance. And so we can use these socioeconomic factors as a lens through which to better understand brain plasticity. Uh, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, what is poverty? Uh, so poverty is an income level defined by the federal government that varies by family size and composition, meaning the number of adults and children in the home. Interestingly, though, it doesn't vary geographically. So a family of four here in Philadelphia has the same poverty line set for them as a family of four in rural South Dakota, even though clearly the cost of living is quite different in those two places. Does anyone want to hazard a guess what the current poverty line is for a family with two adults and two kids? $24,000. Very nice for the postdoc. Um, so uh, just over $24,000 currently. Um, and so if you can imagine raising a family of four in a city like Philadelphia on that amount, that would be quite challenging. Um, and of course, growing up in poverty puts children at risk for a host of negative outcomes in terms of both physical and mental health as well as school achievement. Um, and yet, nonetheless, despite these risks, it's quite prevalent with uh, childhood poverty currently hovering at around one in five children across the US. Uh, when we look at children in near poverty, so just above the poverty line, that number just about doubles. <coughs> okay, now when I talk about socioeconomic status or SES, I'm talking about more than just poverty. I just told you that poverty is strictly defined based on family income, whereas SES is thought to conceptualize income, but also other factors like parents' educational attainment, occupational prestige, and more recently people have begun to consider subjective social status or where one sees oneself on the social hierarchy. And we know that when childhood SES is conceptualized in these ways, it tends to be strongly associated with a number of important outcomes for children's cognitive development. Things like achievement tests, grade retention, literacy, IQ, and school graduation rates. And it turns out that this socioeconomic gap in achievement tends to emerge early and then widen throughout the elementary years. So the data I'm about to show you are from the British cohort study of 1970, which followed tens of thousands of children in the UK longitudinally from age two to age 10. Now, of course, you're not gonna give a two-year-old and a 10-year-old the same cognitive tests, right? Because their abilities are very different. So instead of looking at absolute score, on the y-axis, I'm showing you cognitive performance in percentile or uh, relative rank well, relative to one's same age peers, okay? So I first wanna draw your attention to children who at age two performed at the 90th percentile, so outperformed 90% of other two-year-olds, who happened to come from socioeconomically advantaged homes. So those high early scoring children from higher SES homes tended to perform above average throughout the course of childhood. Okay. Um, next, I wanna draw your attention to children who started out at the 10th percentile at age two, so performing uh, worse than 90% of their two-year-old peers, and children who happened to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. So these uh, low early scoring children from lower SES homes tended to perform below average throughout the course of childhood. So far, nothing uh, too tremendously surprising. What's a little bit more surprising, though, is what happens to what we might consider the crossover groups. So next, I want you to consider kids who also started out at the 10th percentile at age two, but who happened to come from socioeconomically advantaged homes. So those uh, children from higher SES homes who were low early scorers actually rose in their relative rank over the course of childhood, so that by age 10, they were performing at or even a little bit above average. 
And finally, and most disconcertingly, what happened to those children who at age two were outperforming 90% of their two-year-old peers, but who happened to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes? Well, those children actually fell in their relative rank over the course of childhood, such that by age 10, childhood uh, family socioeconomic circumstance is a much better predictor of achievement than is early cognitive skill. Now again, recall that we're talking about percentiles here. It's not actually that these children lost cognitive skills, but relative to other same age peers, they were performing more poorly. Okay. Uh, so I think that's a particularly dramatic illustration of the emergence of socioeconomic disparities across childhood. And it really leads to the question as to what factors may be contributing to this socioeconomic gap in achievement. And you all could likely come up with many factors, right? Things like nutrition, differences in healthcare, uh, differences in drug exposure, differences in exposure to environmental toxicants like secondhand smoke or lead, differences in the home learning environment, differences in early schooling or family stress. And to this laundry list and the many others that you all could likely come up with, I would say yes, really each of those has been shown to contribute in part to the link between socioeconomic disparities and children's cognitive skill. So how do we make sense of this? Well, one way is to recognize that quote unquote cognitive skill is too broad of an outcome for us to be considering. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, traditional achievement measures like IQ or school graduation rates aren't specific in terms of brain function, right? There's no high school graduation nucleus in the brain. Um, so we can be much more specific in terms of asking which particular cognitive skills and corresponding brain circuitry seem to be most strongly associated with socioeconomic status factors. Um, and so that's exactly the approach that we take as neuroscientists when we realize that uh, neuroscience <laughs> teaches us that different brain structures and circuits support different kinds of cognitive skills like language, memory, executive function, and spatial skills to name a few. And so by taking a neuroscience approach, we can ask which core cognitive systems and corresponding brain circuitry are most highly associated with socioeconomic factors. And that's the approach that we took uh, back when I was a graduate student here at Penn over 10 years ago in Dr. Martha Farah's lab, um, where uh, we recruited several cohorts of socioeconomically diverse families and simply asked the question as to which particular cognitive skills would vary most dramatically along socioeconomic lines. Uh, the data I'm showing here are from a study of 150 first grade children, um, but actually our findings across this series of studies were remarkably consistent. So from kindergarten on up through adolescence, we saw uh, the largest socioeconomic disparities in children's language development with more modest but consistent differences in memory and certain aspects of executive function or the ability to control impulses and, and stay on the task at hand. So this led to several new questions that we're currently activating, actively investigating in my lab. Uh, number one, how do these differences in cognitive development relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure? Number two, just how early are socioeconomic disparities detectable? I just told you that initial set of behavioral studies started with children uh, who were starting formal schooling in kindergarten. Uh, so clearly, if we could detect effects at the start of formal schooling, they must emerge before that, <laughs> but when? Uh, number three, which experiences, particularly modifiable experiences, seem to account for or explain socioeconomic differences in children's cognitive and brain development? And finally, number four, how can this work in form interventions? So we'll touch on each of these questions in turn. So uh, the first question, how do these differences, these socioeconomic disparities in cognitive development, relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure? Um, well, most studies of brain structure in children have focused on the volume of the cerebral cortex, or the thin layer of cells on the outer surface of the brain that do most of the cognitive heavy lifting. Um, but if you recall from your high school geometry, when we're looking at volume, we're talking about two different measures. So if you can imagine for a moment that the cortex was shaped like this uh, cylinder, you know that the volume of the cylinder is the height of the cylinder, so uh, uh, analogous to cortical thickness, times the area of the circle on top, analogous to surface area. Um, and this is important because uh, these two features of brain structure actually operate in opposite directions over the course of childhood and adolescence. So if you imagine that uh, the brain was shaped like a can of soup, for example, the cortex becomes progressively thinner over the course of childhood and adolescence, so going from a soup can to a tuna fish can, as it were. Um, and at the same time, 
the surface area or the area of the circle on top progressively expands through much of childhood. So going from a tomato paste can to a full-fledged can of soup. Um, this is important because not only do those two characteristics operate in different directions, but they reflect different things. Um, so it's there's a little bit of mixed data on this, but generally speaking, um, a thinner cortex is often associated with higher cognitive skill, and a larger surface area is often associated with higher cognitive skill. And so if we're conflating those two features by looking at cortical volume, we're missing some of the nuance here. Okay, so uh, in a very large study of over a thousand children and adolescents who all received uh, brain scans, we were able to disentangle those two measures of brain structure by looking separately at surface area and cortical thickness. Um, and so what we found, dealing first with surface area, was that in general, higher family income was associated with larger cortical surface area. So to orient everyone, since I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, pictures of the brain, um, this is the front of the brain, this is the back, this is a picture of the side of the brain, so if a person was looking in that direction. Um, here again, this is the front of the brain and this is the back, but this is a picture looking straight down the middle of the brain. And what you see is every area uh, shown here in color represents an area where at that point, across these thousand uh, children and adolescents, we see a positive association where higher family income was associated with larger brain surface area at that point across all of these children. Um, and so what you see is that in general, we see this relationship across most of the cortex. Um, and yet there are certain areas where this relationship is particularly strong, shown in yellow. So areas uh, like the inferior frontal gyrus and parts of the temporal lobe that are known to be important for supporting language, as well as areas like the anterior cingulate cortex, which is known to be important for supporting parts of executive functioning. And so the very areas where we find the greatest socioeconomic disparities in brain structure are the regions that support the cognitive skills where we had previously found the largest differences. Now, a couple points to note here. Um, number one, this relationship between family income and, and uh, cortical surface area wasn't linear. Uh, instead, this link was strongest among the most disadvantaged families, meaning that dollar for dollar, small increases in income were associated with proportionately greater differences in brain structure among the poorest children. Um, and secondly, this is a really critical point. Um, so yes, across this sample of over a thousand children and adolescents, we saw a link between family income and children's brain structure, but there was tremendous variability from one child to the next. So there were plenty of children from more advantaged homes who had smaller brain surfaces, plenty of children from more disadvantaged homes who had larger brain surfaces, and so in no way could I know an individual child's family income and with any accuracy predict that particular child's brain structure. An analogy I like to draw uh, with the press is between gender and height, right? So we all know that on average in childhood at any one age, boys tend to be taller than girls. But of course, go into any elementary school classroom across the United States and you'll find some girls who are taller than some boys. The analogy holds here. Does anyone have any questions about that? All right. Um, now what about that other aspect of uh, brain structure that I mentioned, cortical thickness? Uh, so this is work that was led by two postdocs in my lab, uh, Lou Piccolo and Emily Merce, shown here. Um, and so what they found was, uh, so first, the broadest pattern that we saw with cortical thickness was the one that I mentioned earlier. On average, as uh, with age, we see smaller cortical, uh, we see cortical thinning, right? So um, the individuals who are older in the sample tended to have thinner cortices than uh, the individuals who are younger. So that is clearly the, the biggest pattern in the data. And yet, when we look across socioeconomic lines, we see that um, this link between uh, age and cortical thickness isn't exactly the same for everyone. So what we saw uh, showing you here, children of the uh, most highly educated parents in red, middle educated parents in green, and uh, the least educated parents in the sample in blue, what we see is that um, the children of the less educated parents tend to show a steeper age-related decline in cortical thickness early on, and then a leveling off sometime around mid-adolescence, whereas children of the more highly educated parents seem to show a shallower, perhaps more protracted uh, course of cortical thinning. Now keep in mind these are cross-sectional data, not longitudinal, so we can't make strong claims about the development of brain structure, um, but we can say that perhaps uh, these data are consistent with the notion that um, socioeconomic di disadvantage may actually lead to a premature acceleration of brain development, which has been shown in uh, animals as well as uh, humans experiencing adversity. 
Okay. Now, you might ask, well, does this matter, right? So if we see these socioeconomic differences in brain structure, do they actually uh, support or, or are they actually responsible for the differences in cognition that I mentioned earlier? So preliminarily, we think that they do indeed matter. For example, uh, work by people like John Gabrielli and Seth Pollack has suggested that differences in brain structure may account for anywhere between 15 and 44% of the income achievement gap. Okay. So moving on to our second question, if these differences do matter, just how early are these socioeconomic differences in brain and behavior detectable? Um, so to begin to ask this question, again, we turn first to behavior. Um, and uh, I should say that the, the sort of cheat sheet or the, the quick answer is that for behavior, we seem to see differences in the second year of life. <coughs> and for the brain, we seem to see differences as early as the first year of life. So let me walk you through a little bit of data uh, to support that. So first, uh, turning to behavior, this was a study we did a couple years ago in which we recruited a sample of socioeconomically diverse families with infants. And we followed those infants longitudinally, either from 9 to 15 or from 15 to 21 months. Um, here on the y-axis, I'm showing you z-scores. So that means that a, a score of zero means that children were performing um, at the average compared to their same age peers. Um, the blue line represents children of the most highly educated parents in this sample. Uh, the red represents children of middle educated parents, and the green represents the children of the least educated parents in the sample. And so what you see is from 9 to 15 months, these lines are relatively flat, right? So here I'm showing you language development, and that suggests that we're not really seeing the emergence of socioeconomic disparities in language development just yet by 15 months. But from 15 to 21 months, we're seeing something very different. So here, what we're seeing is that children of the more highly educated parents are rising to the top of the distribution, whereas children of the less educated parents are unfortunately falling to the bottom of the distribution. And this difference between the blue line and the green line is not just what we call statistically significant, but clinically significant as well. So to give you a sense, uh, for those of you who have a statistics background, this is a large effect size of about 0.8 standard deviations. Uh, to put that in context, that's equivalent in magnitude to about 12 IQ points. And again, we weren't measuring um, uh, IQ here. This is a composite of various language scores. But it nonetheless gives you a sense of just how large the disparities already are before children even turn two. And uh, we found the same thing when we looked at children's memory development across this age range. Again, by 21 months, we found about 0.8 standard deviations of difference uh, comparing the more socioeconomically advantaged to disadvantaged children. Um, OK, so what about the brain? Um, well, the pictures I showed you before used MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. If any of you have ever had an MRI or seen one, you know that it involves sitting perfectly still in a dark and noisy tube. Fine for adults or older children, maybe not so great for, uh, for infants and toddlers. Um, so instead of using MRI for our youngest children, we use something called electroencephalogram, or EEG, which looks like this basically a net of electrodes uh, that the child wears as a cap, um, and uh, the child can sit comfortably in his or her caretaker's lap. And using EEG, we can measure electrical activity of the brain by placing these electrodes on the scalp and amplifying the signal. Um, and then this signal can be decomposed into oscillations that occur in different frequency bands that look like this. Uh, and these aren't just squiggles, they actually have meaning. Uh, so for example, children who are at risk for learning and attention problems tend to exhibit uh, excess low frequency oscillations and a deficit of higher frequency <coughs> oscillations. So we set out to ask whether we would see socioeconomic differences in this resting brain function very early in life. This was work led by Natalie Brito, who uh, just finished her postdoc with me and just joined the faculty at NYU. Um, and so Natalie was interested in really pushing the envelope and seeing could we see socioeconomic differences very, very early <coughs> in life uh, in newborns. So within the first several days of life, would we see any difference uh, in resting brain function as a function of the child's socioeconomic circumstance? Uh, and her answer was a resounding no. So she found absolutely no evidence for socioeconomic disparities in brain function at birth, no matter where across the scalp she looked, no matter which frequency band uh, she looked in, and whether she looked at family income or parents' education. Um, now, it's not the case that um, there were no differences in resting brain function at birth, right? So you see some kids with, with uh, this is 
high frequency power, so some kids with lower high frequency power, some kids with higher high frequency power. And indeed, the newborn pattern of electrical activity did predict those children's uh, subsequent language and memory development at 15 months. So it wasn't that um, brain function at birth was meaningless. It carried meaning and, and some predictive value. That meaning just wasn't explained by family socioeconomic circumstance. Um, and so while it certainly doesn't um, uh, prove the idea that, that uh, socioeconomic disparities emerge as a result of postnatal experience, it's at least consistent with that idea. Um, now, ongoing work in my lab in which we're uh, looking at children at the second half of the first year of life tells a different story. So these are infants between 6 and 12 months of age, and here, by the second half of the first year, we are seeing socioeconomic disparities in resting brain function. So children um, from higher family income, or in this case, income to needs, which is simply income adjusted for family size, uh, do show evidence of greater high frequency power. Uh, so that then leads to our third set of questions. So what experiences might be accounting for these differences? Um, so I already showed you this slide of some possible causes. In my lab, we're really interested in two of these, namely the home language environment and family stress. So let me walk you through a, a theoretical model that we uh, have been um, grappling with and trying to test in my lab. So the theoretical model goes like this. We know that there are socioeconomic disparities in the home language environment, meaning the quality and quantity of language that children hear. In turn, we believe that the home language environment likely plays a critical role in shaping the development of parts of the brain that support language. Simultaneously, we know that uh, socioeconomic disadvantage tends to be associated with higher levels of family stress. We know from both animal and human work that stress has uh, particularly important effects on certain circuitry in the brain. Parts of the brain like the hippocampus, which supports memory, as well as prefrontal and limbic circuitry, which support aspects of cognitive and emotional self-regulation. So uh, we're currently trying to test this entire model in my lab. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the evidence to support it and uh, how we're going about testing it uh, currently. So first, focusing on that top arm of the model, what can I tell you about socioeconomic differences in the home language environment? Um, so some of you may recognize these data. These are data from Hart and Risley, who were pioneering researchers in the mid-1990s, who followed a group of socioeconomically diverse families longitudinally for the first several years of their children's lives. Uh, every year, they, or every month, they went into these families' homes, and for a couple of hours, tape recorded every word that the children heard and every word that they spoke. They then brought their uh, tape recorders back to the lab, where some poor research assistant had to transcribe everything. Um, and what they found was that at every age, the uh, children from the more advantaged homes tended to hear more words than the children from the less advantaged homes. And so extrapolating this out over every waking hour over the course of these children's first several years of life, uh, these authors calculated that that amounted to a 30 million word gap in terms of the number of words heard when comparing the children from the more advantaged to the more disadvantaged homes. Uh, and then later work showed it wasn't just the number of words that varied so dramatically, but also the complexity and responsiveness or back and forth nature of the verbal interactions that varied as a function of socioeconomic factors. Um, work subsequent to that showed that the number of words children heard tended to be directly related to their vocabulary size. And I've already shown you that some of the areas where we see the most dramatic socioeconomic disparities in brain structure are the regions that support language development. And so we in my lab are currently asking whether the home language environment may explain these socioeconomic differences in the brain. Uh, now we have a little bit of an easier time than Hart and Risley and their poor research assistants because we're able to capitalize um, on this little device known as the LENA or language environment analysis tool. It's basically a small digital recorder that fits into specialized clothing that the child wears. Um, they wear it uh, over the course of 8 to 16 hours at home hopefully give it back to us. And then uh, we're able to plug it into our computer and the software automatically analyzes the number of words children hear over the course of the day. It also analyzes the number of conversational turns or back and forth nature of, of uh, these verbal interactions as well as the number of child vocalizations. And indeed, we are finding that the home language environment here as operationalized as uh, hourly adult words is related to brain function in these young children. So between 6 and 12 months of age, um, children who hear more adult words are showing uh, 
higher rates of high frequency power. Um, similarly, work by uh, my other postdoc, Emily Merce, who's looked at uh, the same phenomenon in older children, so five to nine year olds, where we actually are able to scan them, is finding uh, something similar. So here again, greater adult words is associated in this case with uh, differences in brain structure, so larger surface area of the left superior temporal gyrus, a region that is known to support aspects of language processing. Okay. Um, so what can I tell you about the bottom arm of the model? What do we know about socioeconomic differences in family stress? Um, so as you might imagine, socioeconomic disadvantage tends to be associated with higher family stress in terms of uh, things like limitations of material resources, chaos in the home, potentially exposure to neighborhood violence. And we know that when um, family life is characterized by stress, relationships uh, are often characterized by conflict or withdrawal rather than the kind of warm and nurturing parenting that we know is so critical for children's social and emotional development. Um, a number of studies have suggested that socioeconomically disadvantaged children may have altered levels of stress <coughs> hormones like cortisol. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, really decades of work in both the animal and human literature suggests that stress has cascading effects on certain brain regions in particular, like the hippocampus supporting memory and parts of uh, the prefrontal cortex supporting executive function. So we reasoned that perhaps differences in chronic stress may explain socioeconomic differences in brain structure in these regions. Uh, now, to operationalize chronic stress, we're doing that in several ways. We're asking parents about their perceptions of stress and their experience of various stressful life events. Uh, we're also collecting measures of stress physiology using cortisol or stress hormone. Uh, most commonly, cortisol is measured using saliva, uh, but that um, uh, carries with it a number of methodological challenges. So our level of cortisol in our saliva and in our blood varies over the course of the day. It varies based on the day of week, based on what we just ate, if we're ill, if we're taking certain medications. So it's, it's a complicated measure. Um, more recently, people have begun looking at cortisol in hair, which is a nice way of, of uh, collecting cortisol because uh, cortisol is chronically secreted into hair. So if you take a small several centimeter um, bit of hair, sample of hair, you actually get a uh, average level of cortisol over the last several months. So it's not, it's not um, dependent on time of day or, or the number of measures. You can just get one sample in the lab. So we are currently looking at hair cortisol uh, in parents and in our older children as well. Um, so the first question was simply, would we see socioeconomic differences in this measure? Um, and so earlier this year, we published that yes, we do. So um, parents with, who are more highly educated tend to have lower levels of hair cortisol. Uh, this is also true of their children. And what's interesting is that held even when controlling for parents' hair cortisol levels. Um, so it's not just the case that, that stress physiology seems to be heritable, but it really does seem like there's perhaps something about um, socioeconomic advantage that may be uh, leading to lower levels of uh, stress hormone in, in both parents and children independently. Um, when we look at family income, again, we see that higher income is associated with lower levels of parent hair cortisol. But here, the uh, relationship isn't linear. So uh, much like the brain data I mentioned earlier, we actually see a logarithmic effect, meaning that a small amount of increased income uh, among the, the most disadvantaged families is associated with a much steeper decline in hair cortisol. Uh, interestingly, family income wasn't associated with stress physiology in the children, so suggesting that perhaps it's not material resources that's leading to uh, differences in stress, but perhaps something related to parenting style that uh, tends to correlate more closely with educational differences. Okay, um, what about when we look in the brain of these children? So in our older children, our five to nine year old sample, uh, we are finding that higher parental perceived stress, so their reports of stress, uh, tend to be associated with smaller hippocampal volume in the children, um, as well as higher parent hair cortisol being associated with smaller hippocampal volume. Um, and again, those two effects are independent. So both perceptions of stress and parent stress physiology is somehow linked to children's brain structure. Uh, we don't have a large enough sample yet to estimate whether this difference is accounting for socioeconomic differences, but that's uh, where we're hopefully headed. Okay, 
So the picture I've tried to paint for you so far is a, a pathway whereby what we think is happening is that socioeconomic differences in family and child experience leads to differences in the development of children's brain structure and function and ultimately cognition and behavior. Um, and so if we're right and experience matters, it begs the question as to whether this work can inform <coughs> interventions. Uh, and if so, what's the right level at which to intervene? So certainly you can imagine intervening at almost any of these levels. Um, and so where should we be focusing our efforts? Um, so certainly we can imagine intervening at, at uh, the, what I would call the most proximal level at the level of cognition itself through school-based interventions. Certainly, school-based interventions represent the most common form of intervention addressing socioeconomic disparities in achievement. Um, and in many cases, these uh, school-based interventions can be quite promising in, in uh, reducing the income achievement gap. But as any interventionist would tell you, school-based interventions tend to be labor-intensive and costly if done right. Um, and unfortunately, school-based interventions quite commonly suffer from uh, fade-out, which is this idea that perhaps immediately after the cessation of the intervention, you can detect a difference. But then if you go back and test the same children six months or a year later, often those differences fade away. Um, now, it doesn't suggest that school-based interventions are, are not worthwhile, but it does suggest that perhaps we would need to uh, sustain them even longer, which of course gets quite costly. Um, and further, I would argue that if we're waiting until school, we're likely waiting too late, right? So I would never deny the critical importance of high quality early childhood education, but I already told you that by the time children are two, we're already seeing really dramatic differences. So again, school is clearly very important, but if we're putting all of our eggs in that basket, we're probably waiting too late. Okay, so what about taking a step back and trying to change children's or families' experience, most commonly through parenting interventions? Um, again, there are a number of excellent examples of parenting interventions. Often uh, these involve a home visiting component like nurse family partnerships where uh, you know, we can see large scale interventions that show at least moderate effect sizes. Um, but again, interventions that are, are targeting parents' behavior tend to be labor intensive and costly if done right. Um, in addition to challenges around fade out, like we talked about with school-based interventions, uh, parenting-based interventions often uh, face challenges in terms of lack of uptake as well as attrition, right? In some sense, if you are doing an intervention in the school and the school has bought in, then you have something of a captive audience. Whereas if you're individually recruiting parents, you're challenged with uh, how to get them to sign up for your intervention and how to keep them enrolled. And I would say even more than school-based interventions, home-based interventions are really relatively difficult to scale up, right? It's one thing to bring 100 families into your lab for six weeks to try to teach them something. It's quite another to scale that kind of intervention up to the community level or beyond. Not to say it can't happen, but it, it certainly is challenging. So uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to challenge you to imagine intervening at the most distal level by changing socioeconomic status itself. So you might say, well, how could we do that? Um, well, uh, so correlational work has suggested that small income boosts can have big effects. So for example, again, correlational work has looked at uh, differences on the order of about $4,000 in annual family income between the prenatal year and age two. Uh, and these studies have found that on average, that small difference is associated with a 19% increase in adult earnings when those children grow up. Uh, more time spent in the labor force, and even some evidence for improved health when those children grow up. Uh, and so based on, this, on uh, that type of evidence, we're interested in moving past correlation to understand whether differences in family income are actually causing these differences in children's outcomes. Uh, so, as uh, you're all likely aware, the gold standard uh, in science for understanding causality is through a clinical trial, a randomized control trial. And so with that in mind, I'm really uh, delighted to be part of a team of investigators launching the first clinical trial of poverty reduction in early childhood in the United States. Uh, my social science collaborators are economist Greg Duncan, um, social policy expert Catherine Magnuson, behavioral economist Lisa Genetian, and developmental psychologist Hiro Yoshikawa. And I'm the uh, lead neuroscientist of the team. So uh, the, the goal of the study is large, although the premise is really quite simple. Our plan is to recru recruit 1,000 poor mothers uh, at the time they give birth um, across four sites across the country. And everybody will receive cash. Um, so 
These thousand mothers will receive an unconditional cash transfer, so cash that they can spend any way they would like, over the four, first 40 months, or slightly over three years, of their uh, children's lives. Um, but one group will be receiving a large monthly income supplement of $333 a month, which amounts to $4,000 a year. And the other group will receive a nominal monthly income supplement of $20 a month, or $240 a year. Um, now, the difference between those groups is uh, about equal to the earned income tax credit. It's an amount that has been shown in correlational work to move the needle. Achievement tests tend to be uh, raised by about 0.2 standard deviations. And uh, this amount of added income, as I mentioned, has been associated with health differences down the road. Now, how will we be implementing it? Well, when we recruit these mothers in the hospital, we will give them a debit card that is preloaded. And then this debit card will automatically reload every month on the anniversary of the child's birthday. Uh, so in this way, by comparing these two groups in this clinical trial, we'll be able to estimate the causal impact of poverty reduction on children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development over the course of the first three years when we believe that the developing brain is most malleable to experience. Uh, so what are we actually going to do? Uh, so we'll be administering a survey in the hospital and following up at age one. At age two, we're actually going to travel into the homes of these families to, uh, again, um, administer a survey, but also video record some parent-child interaction uh, and measure stress physiology of both the child and the parent. And then at age three, we'll be inviting um, these families into the lab so that we can take a detailed assessment of children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development um, at that time point. Uh, I'm happy to say that we recently uh, received funding from NIH as well as a consortium of foundations, and so our plan is to launch this study in April of 2018. All right, so how do we think that this added income is likely to affect the lives of families? So there are two main pathways that we're hypothesizing. One we're calling the increased investment pathway. So this is this idea that with added economic resources, parents are likely to be able to afford things like more books and toys, more trips to the museum, but also higher quality childcare, potentially better housing in better neighborhoods. Um, and then the other we're calling the reduced stress pathway. So this is this idea that if a mother is less worried about being able to uh, make that rent check at the end of the month or keep the lights on, she's much more likely to be able to engage with her child in the warm and nurturing way that we know is so critical for children's development. Now, chances are these two pathways may vary from one family to the next. So although, although we're carefully measuring these family processes, uh, our hypotheses really center around the ultimate impact on the children. Uh, we recently com completed a pilot study in my lab with 30 women uh, who we followed over the course of a year. Uh, we were pleased to find that our implementation procedures seemed to be quite feasible. So over 93% of the sample were retained in the study over the course of the year. Uh, and these mothers reported very few problems with using the debit card, which was really great because for over one in five of these moms, it was their first time ever using a debit card. So we weren't sure if it would work and uh, we're pleased to find that um, the mothers did not have any problems accessing the cash. Um, we also implemented a qualitative component to the pilot study to talk to these moms about their experience getting free money. Um, and they reported to us that even in small amounts, the money seemed to make a big difference. So for example, one mom said, believe it or not, even an extra $20 helps. There were times I found myself completely broke. I go and I use it and that means I can make it for another week. And another mom told us, the money from the card really, really helped me out especially one month that we didn't have the food stamps, we didn't have anything at all. Um, now, of course, a, a, an intervention with only uh, 30 participants, as in the pilot study, isn't statistically powered to be able to detect the kinds of effects that we're going to be looking for in a real study. Nonetheless, of course, as scientists, we took a peek. Um, and so you should take this with a grain of salt because of the small sample size. But patterns suggested um, on the order of a half a standard deviation favoring the treatment group um, that the treatment group mothers reported higher center-based childcare, uh, more frequent reports of mother-child activities, less household chaos, and less parenting stress. OK, so um, if our hypotheses are borne out and uh, our evidence suggests that boosting family income can, in fact, change children's trajectories, trajectories for the better, it may have real implications in terms of public policy. Now, currently, the US is really lagging behind our developed country peers in terms of the size of public spending on children and families. But it doesn't have to be this way. So if we look at poverty rates over time for uh, senior citizens in blue versus children in red, what we see is that uh, the rates of, of uh, 
poverty among our senior citizens used to be quite high, upwards of one in three. But then with the advent of public policies like uh, Social Security and Medicare, that number has steadily fallen to the fewer than 10% that, that um, uh, live in poverty today. Whereas for children, uh, we've seen some impact on child poverty through the advent of Medicaid, but generally uh, our government has not favored po public policies that uh, reduce uh, family and childhood poverty, and so that number has steadily crept back up to more than one in five. Um, and so it's our hope that our study will have the potential to provide direct evidence of the effects of poverty reduction on the developing brain and mind, which could inform the debates on the generosity or cuts both to new programs as well as existing social service programs that affect the lives of millions of young families. Uh, things like SNAP or food stamps, WIC or the Women, Infant and Children program, TANF, which is formerly known as welfare, housing vouchers, and then things that have been in the news quite a bit lately like paid family leave or the minimum wage. And so while I would never suggest that income is the only or even the most important factor in determining child development, it may be the most manipulable from a policy perspective. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank my lab collaborators and funders, and I thank you for your attention.